Hello, everyone. Hello, Bookworm community. Um, here we are again, Jana. Yes, hello, everyone. Uh, this time I'm back in Helsinki, so I sent everyone warm hugs and kisses from a very rainy and gloomy Helsinki, but still nice finish May. And Petya? Um, and I am um, directly with you from, from Bulgaria, um, sunnier, warmer, and nearly a typical May. So we are going to try to um, integrate these two very different settings into our today's session. We have a very special book we're going to discuss. And it's a very special book, which I decided to <laughs> Um, sent to Yana to give for her birthday. That's why it's obviously very special. And um, our today's, um, the, the book we're going to discuss today is Physics of Sorrow by um, Leonidas Podino. And it's a very special day indeed. We're going to um, talk about this book um, on, because um, tomorrow is the uh, St. George Day. Um, it's the, um, the special day, the name day of um, which is celebrated um, in, in Bulgaria. It's also a bank holiday um, dedicated to George the, the Dragon Slayer, um, which is also connected to, to our book, how it is connected to our book. Um, yeah, just stay with us and you're going to get it. Awesome. Yes. So, um... Indeed, I received this book by post for my birthday uh, from Peter, and I was very excited. In fact, to be perfectly honest with you, this is my first book by um, a Bulgarian author. So, and not just any Bulgarian writer, right? But the most translated um, in foreign languages since 1989. But of course, Peter will maybe give more um, introduction and shed light on who Georgi Gospodinov is, but um, I must say I was very excited um, and this degree of excitement uh, proved itself right when I just started reading, although it wasn't an easy and smooth journey, but more about it uh, to come. So oh, um, a few details on um, Gary Gospodinov, uh, not really, really briefly. Um, he was born in 1968 in Yambo in South Eastern Bulgaria, if geography is not leaving me alone <laughs> on that stage. Um, and he's, as Tiana mentioned, the most translated Bulgarian author. He's a, um, he's a truly, as I may say, European uh, soul, European author. Um, he um, was uh, teaching in Berlin. Um, he was, he is, he, his literature is truly European, but maybe we can talk about this later. And after Natural um, Novel, which was translated in 21 languages, um, Physics of Sorrow is his second novel, but he's also writing short stories and uh, poetry. And he also, he has great, um, short movies, or they are great short movies, um, which are based on his um, on his oeuvre, on, on his uh, literature, and directed by Theodor Oshev, by another um, Bulgarian um, director and artist. And um, I think it's um, it's a very important one to start with if you're starting with Bulgarian authors uh, just now. Um, and maybe I direct, um, I would direct this next question to Jana, how, how it felt um, to read it. Was it something totally new? Did you get new impulses or it was well integrated into that that you have known so far? Yeah. Well, there is no straightforward answer to it, you know, in a way, um, it was like, first of all, just to start, because this is our third video, third episode. And just before uh, this video, we were discussing another book of, of the Polish writer uh, called The Flights, right, by Olga Tokarczuk. And that was also postmodernistic essayistic writing, uh, where you have those um, 
on the first at the first glance disruptive things and uh, stories existing inside in silos but as you proceed reading you find out that maybe there are connections and maybe they are interlinked and interwoven into each other so having that already mindset with me when i set out on the journey to read this book uh this didn't become a sh sort of shock or some novelty to me so but actually i would imagine that for some people that would be something really um, um like a different cup of tea that let's go that way uh it's it's it doesn't um doesn't lay all the the whole picture you know in front of you straight away so you 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 need to collect that puzzle that jigsaw or uh i would even start to wander in this labyrinth and explore it uh yourself and probably will get into the labyrinth more uh but at the same time it was an easy read for me uh like that said because I felt so many similarities with the Soviet uh, Union and a Soviet era, um, yeah, in, for example, Leningrad, even though I didn't know about, like, I, I didn't live in Leningrad in Soviet uh, era, but a lot of pictures, images, uh, stories and narratives felt, felt like past of my family or felt, uh, past of my past generations. So, uh, I could definitely relate to. Um, so, but it's it's definitely um, a very fresh perspective on how a novel can look like, and it's very intriguing. Uh, it's puzzling. It's complex, but it's bewildering. I would I would describe it like that. Uh, what are your thoughts? Maybe some adjectives, Tatum. Um... I'm glad you mentioned the the word or the method uh, of the labyrinth. Um, because I would I would say that the, the book we discussed we discussed last time, um, Over the Gertrude's Flight, that has been a puzzle that has been a jigsaw. And Gospodino's um, book, Gospodino's uh, Physics of Sorrow, it's a labyrinth. So I think these are slightly different metaphors or slightly different ways. Yeah. There is something teleological about the puzzle too, but there is something more teleological about the labyrinth. Definitely. I meant like just you have this... dive from your classical, you know, narrative uh, of your like, for example, generation saga or your classical fiction narrative, then it will be something of a splash in the face. But for me, like I mean, coming from this already disruptive postmodernistic uh, style, it wasn't that big of a change in that sense. But yeah, they are different for sure. Sorry. Yeah, there there is a different also a different perspective um, from the uh, well. You you wanted some some adjectives. I would mention um, this kind. It's not an adjective. It's a noun, but it's struggle um, struggle with this uh, collective past and also the the magical realism is um, also this kind of very. It's it's nothing new. It's this um, also one of the ways in the in this literature um, setting to um, work through a country's difficult past to add some uh, magical um, components to um, somehow ease the struggle or to be able to to continue with the struggle so that's where you add uh, magic um, which has been a very um, interesting um, compilation and combination in um, um book. Um, and what is, um, I've uh, read a couple of um, interviews with him and he said something which uh, rang a bell uh, for me um, and it, it sounds completely, um, it's something very, um, Plakative, but I, I think we should um, edit over here. And that is that we are made of the books we've read. Um, and when you when you say this, when you um, when you try to work with this, you see that there is this red thread um, going along the the books you're choosing and the books um, which are choosing you and finding you. Um, and then we are again um, at the at the very beginning, at the start of the, of the labyrinth. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, I actually, 
I would say that it also rings the bell for me with this quote, and I almost um, have a temptation to attribute it to Ray Bradbury because it's just something that he would say, uh, because he was always saying that he was getting education, uh, high education, not in a university, but in a library. Uh, but yeah, that's a topic of another discussion. Uh, so maybe just quickly to set the scene, what this book about, if you can really sort of um, introduce it in, in a few lines. Uh, it basically, and please elaborate on what I say and correct me if I'm wrong, because you read it in Bulgarian, I read it in English, that would be interesting if there are different perspectives there also. So this is basically a novel that is set around uh, the myth of Minotaur. Um, a, a creation, a uh, half bull, half human who was born um, from a woman um, and uh, minus a king um, whose wife cheated on him with a bull and thus this child was born. Um, put this creature or this monster as further story describes it um, to into the labyrinth, labyrinth that existed um, in the basement uh, under the palace. And uh, this um, minotaur wanders in this labyrinth and after a number of years, Theseus comes and kills him. Um, and actually Ariadne, uh, who is half sister of this monster minotaur, helps Theseus by giving him a yarn of threads. And by having this yarn, Theseus is able to go out of the labyrinth. And I think, uh, of course, it is an essential part of the no novel. Um, and you will see these threads, these characters appear here and there. But of course, Minotaur is ultimately uh, the main character. Uh, but some maybe would argue that Labyrinth is the main character. And it represents life, it represents collective memory, it uh, represents brain, uh, it represents past, um, well, anything really. Um, and also there's this um, narrator who is probably Georgi Gospodinov, but we don't know for sure. Um, and he's said to have this uh, sy syndrome of being a pathological, um, having pathological empathy uh, for people. So he can travel into lives and pasts of people he encounters and actually recreate and relieve their experiences, um, actually becoming them. Uh, so that is the ultimately sort of like the synopsis of the book, but there is definitely much more, isn't there, Petya? Yeah, there is. Thank you for this very precise and very um, concise um, description. Without that many of spoilers, <laughs> only only a few ones. Um, yeah, I think this is the the exact um, the exact re resume um, of what is going on. But of course, also very interesting is the way um, Gospodinov conveys um, all these all these stories, and also um, integrated in his family story in the family uh, saga, um, which is also a collective um, collective the, the saga of his generation uh, more or less. And also very interesting point is also the, the, um, the myth of the labyrinth, the myth of the Minotaur, um, they are transferred to our times so, or okay, a couple of generations back. And then the Minotaur, he's not far away, he's among us. And he's, okay, I'm not going to spoil it here, but the Minotaur is among us and um, he's near us which also showing the complexity of our times, um, maybe far back the monster or these hidden, hidden desires, they have been um, very, very deep and now they're coming, coming to the surface. Um, and it's also really interesting how, um, I mean, again, um, playing with, uh, with the name of the author, but also with the, with the names of his characters, um, George, St. George is killing, he's slaying the dragon, but in the end, it's the collective, um, this, um, it is man, it is human and monster in one. I mean, we are not, 
we are not either the slayer or the dragon. We are the slayer and the dragon, um, which is also this is and also the, the Minotaur, which is also this um, um, very lonely and very sad kid inside. Um, yeah, that is showing that it's uh, far more complex, that our reality is far more complex. And which is also, of course, um, bringing back the title is it this kind of the of sorrow which is um, existent and which is present in the book. But what would you say about this kind of sorrow? How how did you um, how did you find it? How did it um, correspond with your feelings about the book? Um, I think that the book is filled with sorrow and if you try to squeeze the text um, from, uh, from its pores there will be sorrow pouring out you know like I, I would describe it like that and you could feel it in every line and starting with I don't know so sorry again maybe it will be a spoiler now but you already sort of touched that theme so I wanted just a little bit to expand on it uh, the certain um, sort of image uh, which put my world upside down is when uh, Mr. Gospodinov describes Minotaur as a child who was put in the basement um, under the palace. I never thought of it like, you know, of this myth in, in that way. And of course, when I was studying Greek myths at school, um, you know, and I was reading that one, I always you know, pictured uh, him as a monster, as a, as a creature to be killed. But as so accurately, you just said that, you know, you can't really separate this world. Um, this is the monster and I'm on a good side and I'm, I'm a killer or I'm a saver, you know. Um, and so this was a starting point. But then, you know, for me, again, maybe a spoiler, and I wanted to bring this up. One of the most elevated themes uh, or, or symphonies of this book, I would name Abandoned Children. And I saw this thread throughout the book. Um, and yes, of course, socialism and collective memory and how can you go back to the past and can you and should you go back to the past? But for me, what, what was the most sort of like heartbreaking uh, theme of this book and probably the synonym for sorrow are abandoned children. Uh, it starts again in the socialist era when Gospodinov says that in, in socialism children are invisible. You don't, you don't see them. You know, women are hot, strong, independent, hardworking, you know, men are also of course working and fighting for it. Um, uh, for the good um, and you don't see children and then of course there comes this um, li not little but uh, glimpses of a uh, family saga his grandfather who was abandoned at the mill at the age of three uh, you know uh, him and their generation who were left um, without the knowledge about sex about politics they had to figure everything out themselves again minotaur uh, abandoned as a child and even by the end of the book, uh, Gospodinov, when he most probably writes some passages from his own, from the first hand, uh, he's, he's quoting Holden from The Catcher in the Ray. And I think that's also um, sort of this uh, finishing uh, tongue for this, uh, for this thread. There are children in the Ray, you know, and somebody, maybe Gospodinov, maybe Holden, maybe Tezios, maybe Minotaur himself stands at the end uh, near the sheer drop and tries to catch these children because otherwise they are abandoned in this society and that is a cruel world around us. So yeah, it definitely stayed with me um, maybe as the main theme of this sort of th physics of sorrow. How about you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I think I do not have anything to, to add um, on that. Maybe only that this sorrow is something um, you are living with. It's not something that is going to kill you. Obviously, it's um, not obviously, but in, in this sense, it's existential. It's part of your existence. It's there. It's part of your collective memory. It's part of your past. It's part of your 
um, generations um, task, if you wish, not somehow to overcome it, but to live with it. Yeah. Um, I, I found it there um, and I didn't find the, the ways or like the, the, the solutions how to how to overcome it. It, it was there, it was omni, omnipresent. Um, but that was also a great, um, great experience to have it from age one till the very end. Um, it's also very interesting and uh, present in a different way in the next um, novel by Gospodino Fairet uh, last year. Um, it has a very interesting name. I'm not sure I'm going to translate it correctly in English, but it's called it's called like the same save heaven from time. Like when when you want to um, somehow um, fly away or uh, get a safe heaven from time to get this kind of um, capsule um, away from the the stream of time. It's I hope it's going to be translated in other languages soon, so uh, we can also discuss it. But it's going, it's also, it's, it's going deeper. It's uh, getting more uh, complex, um, and maybe the sorrow is somehow lighter, or it's um, also um, shifting in other directions. Yeah. But in the physics of sorrow, you, you have it also in, in the title, the physics of sorrow. It, it's there. It's you. You can even touch it. You can feel it. You can smell it. It's it's there, through, throughout the book. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it's not, as I said, it's, um, it, that wouldn't be an argument or a point not to read the book. Um, on the contrary, it's um, something that is very enlightening um, in a way. Um, this uh, persistent sorrow or persistent um, struggle with sorrow, which is with, with us, and um, which we are um, going to to have in our in our lives, but still, you're um, you're not overcoming it. You're living with it. Um, it's a very interesting um, concept. Yeah, it's it's very sweet. Let's put it also only that way. Yeah. So maybe because um, you know. I guess there, there, there is some kind of uh, obsession, a good, a good, you know, obsession of Gospodinov with time. And as you said about the next novel and this novel, you know, also it can be related, um, the time capsules. And I think uh, there is part of sorrow in the past um, and the past always stays with us you know, as the memory does. And therefore, of course, it will be always with you. And probably there is no way to deal with it as you can't really deal with it. Okay, you can go back uh, and try to reflect on some things done in the past, but you can't really erase it, uh, right? Or you can't really um, uh, change it. And therefore you can't really erase a change sorrow that comes with it, you know? Um, and okay, this one I didn't realize when I was reading when I was reading the book, but then when I was searching for some reviews, I read a very interesting one, which also gave me yet another perspective on the book, because obviously I got the theme about the past um, and how it's sometimes dangerous to go into it and revive it as this pathological empathy forces, you know, the main character do. But okay, so in 2010, uh, uh, what is right wing Hungarian government tried to impose the law uh, when the archives of the secret Soviet era uh, police force were opened uh, and the access was gained to all the documents um, that had been sort of secured there. Uh, so the government tried to suggest that every person or every family goes to, to an archive and takes only one document and then they can do whatever they want with it, but only one document. And of course, there was a wave of protests from historians who were saying, well, you can't do this because if these documents will um, will be taken into families and will be existing there in silence, you can't have this bigger picture. You can't really understand the past if you have if you don't have this, you know, the all encompassing approach. 
And I think that, uh, so the auth author of, of the review was linking this, probably Gospodinov knew about it or read it, or maybe not. And nothing like this was suggested in Bulgaria as far as I know. But there is some kind of, you know, similar, uh, similar stories here in the, in the physics of sorrow um, about guilt, about collective memory um, of, again, socialism and of the past. And if you take one event from the past, one life from the past, one scene or one story from the past, it does not reflect the whole thing that was happening. And therefore you don't understand it. And therefore you just damage it, you know? So I found it very interesting, this perspective on the past. Yeah, of course, that is also this perspective from the past is um, linked to the, to, to the present times. I think it was also, also in 2010 that um, um, Bulgaria has been ranked as the saddest place. I'm not sure if in Europe or, or globally, mm -hmm. that was also one of the um, one of the impulses or one of the inspirations for Gospodinov to, to write this book, to somehow describe, capture this, this sorrow. And um, I'm, I'm looking around, I'm here in this green May paradise, and I don't know, I mean, obviously, it, it's about the past, it's about the traumatic experiences, mm -hmm. but how can you be surrounded with this, with this beauty and still be sad? This is this very, um, this, this paradox, um, which is uh, somehow also um, capturing the trauma of the Balkans, these traumatic experiences of uh, long time servitude, of long time, um, uh, this kind of yoke um, under the Ottoman Empire and going back um, like the, the age of empires and then the age of socialism and the sorrow is present always there. Um, I've just uh, finished a book by um, another young Bulgarian author, Port um, to the Lake by Kapka Kasabova. Um, it's also more, um, it's focusing on the, um, this mentality, this family threats, um, more in the, in the Western uh, Balkans or in, in the South, in this triangle between Macedonia, now North Macedonia, Albania, and, and Greece. And this omnipresent sorrow um, that, for example, women whose men are going abroad for work, which is also a, lang a long um, standing tradition in the Balkans, they are dressing themselves in black because the men are gone. They're not, they're, 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 they're vivid, they're alive, they're working, but the sorrow is there. And like also this kind of, um, I don't know, somehow eternal, um, eternal impulse to bring this sorrow to the surface mm -hmm. and to, cover everything in black, everything around, um, in a paradox to the to the beauty of the nature and to this um, yeah southern mentality somehow. Because you have this kind of very strong feelings, these very intense uh, feelings um, in the uh, in the Balkans. So maybe that is also connected to this omnipresent sorrow, not from the um, from the rational perspective of these um, traumas of this past, um, but also with the emotional perspective of the um, yeah this uh, mentality picture, this palimpsest of emotions um, raging over here, you can say. So um, I don't know if you if you found something like this also there. Funny enough that you mentioned about like the saddest um, place, um, like uh, Bulgaria was mentioned, what was it, 
2010, then we are now coming from the happiest place, which is this rainy gloom Helsinki, which is also in the book, by the way. So <laughs> uh, find find it there, please <laughs> discover. And then we have a bridge um, call from the happiest to the saddest country, arguably, uh, you know, in very questionable terms. But actually interesting that you mentioned about mentality, that's what I wanted to ask you, actually. Does this novel speak to you on the literary side, on the social side, on the political side? And uh, of course, I don't want to hold you accountable for the whole like Bulgarian nation, but do you think that this is a novel that speaks for the Bulgarian mentality? Mm, as I mentioned, yeah, it, it rings um, a few bells, um, but it is more, it is both. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say that it would be a one-to-one -one, um, that I would say that I would sign everything uh, written in there. But on the other hand, it's also um, a, an export, Bulgarian export, a book which is a very, it's a guide. It's more or less a guide to, to Bulgaria's, uh, I wouldn't say mentality because it, it, you should go um, deeper for that. Maybe you would, um, you would be able to do it uh, within the range of the book, um, but it's a very good um, resume of a very traumatic past of um, generations, um, desires and paths and uh, this labyrinth um, is very well presented. So I would say that it is both. On the one hand, um, it is for, it is the, the, um, the diary <laughs> of, of a nation or of, uh, if you would, um, if you would decide to identify with it. And on the, on the other hand, it's a guide um, to somehow grasp a very traumatic past, um, different layers of, of trauma, different layers of sorrow, but also different layers of hope. Um, so it is both, and I mean, at least, yeah. things. and um, also, um, it, it's 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 much much more than that. Um, I hope we raised the um, also the expectations, and I'm sure that they're going to be fulfilled with with this book. For you, so with this with this start with this starting point with Gospodino, what do you have this? appetite now for more of uh, Bulgarian, but also Balkan liter literature, um, how would you describe the next step you would like to, to make? Well, definitely, but um, same goes for almost every like regional nation. You know, I'm just also, you know, naturally curious. Um, and also, of course, because I have you by my side, uh, I'm even more curious now. Um, but you know there is a part of me that aches for you for bulgaria in this novel because i as i said in the beginning i recognize so many similar things you know um and therefore i can relate at, and that even deepens uh, the connection so of course i am i'm eager to continue uh you know familiarizing with uh, with the balkan literature so only up up to it but I, I wanted just to say uh, for people, again, who might not be prepared for this style or sort of like are more used to, as we said, for, for to, to a classical, this narrative, um, classical, classically built narrative um, and structure, you may have a feeling from this book that the author is ambling uh, through a museum or labyrinth of his own. And he doesn't really know where he's going and he's just like standing in front of one piece in a museum and then another one, this story part and this image. And he just like looks at them and then translates them into words. You may think this at, at, at first glance, but in the end, this is a very thoughtfully structured 
um, novel. And the author, Mr. Gospodinov, is not just emblem through the museum. He is a curator of that museum or that labyrinth. And he knows all the ways, you know, all the exits, all the entrances, and he tries to lead you. Um, but of course, I was uh, lost a few times, to be honest. Um, in like a few chapters, he, he lost me. I, I, I was just, okay, this one I like more here. Like, I'm not sure what he's talking about. How can I relate to this? And then next page, I turn like to the left, to the right corridor. I'm back, I'm back with him and he, he leads me further. So it's just for everyone who might not be prepared for this style. Um, it may be confusing at times, but it's definitely worth it. Great. Um, I think we uh, went through um, our labyrinth um, ourselves uh, with um, identifying with first uh, talking about the snare, then the monster, then the labyrinth, and in the end we're all of it. We are the creators of the labyrinth, the labyrinth itself, and the monster at the very center of it, and the slayer um, who is um, trying via this uh, thread to find it and, and kill it. Um, so it's complex, it is um, enriching, it is inspiring, it is a door to, um, to a new um, liter literature um, nation, if you, if you wish. And um, yeah, go for it, go for the labyrinth. Definitely. And um, I don't know, it also stayed with me this amazing phrase which opens the book and then closes it. We am I. Uh, right? Or do I quote it correctly? Yeah, we am I. I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, in English it was we am I. And, you know, it's not only about this fictionalized characters in this book and that the character has this pathological empathy and is able to relieve past of his father, grandfather, and thus say, where am I? But it's all of us, all of us in the world, um, all of Bulgarians, all of Russians, all of Finnish people, like the happiest people. We am I? Um, and yeah, again, the Minotaur and Tezos are all alive in one person and the same person in us. So yeah, I agree. Yeah, so cheers to that, to new endeavors and to, um, yeah, to be, be um, inspired to get into the labyrinth and to get out of it. Maybe not really to kill the monster, just we can become friends with the monster, which is um, this sad hint hit, um, inside. Um, yes, awesome. Cheers to that. Keep this. Cheers. Keep this. So yeah, highly recommend read that. So please write in comments if you read it, what you think of it. Um, and if you have any suggestions for the uh, books for our further clubs, feel free to reach out. And of course, if you want to join us. Yes, we are gonna be back and maybe we am I and even more than two, or I don't know, let's see. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. See you. Bye.